In the autumn of 1888, a series of brutal murders in the East End of London lit a flame that sent shockwaves reverberating around the civilized world and caused a scandal that struck right at the heart of the British establishment. Although October would pass with no further murders, historically speaking, the days that followed the double event saw one of the most important developments of the entire saga, because it was during this period that the Whitechapel murderer was given a name. In the wake of the double murder, Sir Charles Warren gave permission for a letter to be released, which on the 27th of September had been sent to the Central News Agency. Written in red ink and addressed to the boss, it boasted in mocking terms. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talked about being on the right track. That joke about the rape gave me real fits. I am down on horse and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand word the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. No. Chillingly, the letter was signed, Jack the Ripper. The police obviously thought the Dear Boss letter did come from the murderer because they reproduced it on huge bill posters and plastered those all around London, so they obviously thought it was genuine. A lot of people actually today, historians-wise, believe what the later police officials believe, that it was actually written by an enterprising journalist. The Dear Boss letter almost certainly wasn't from Jack the Ripper. It's highly unlikely that, uh, that the murderer involved himself in the Ripper investigation or injected himself into the Ripper investigation in that way at all. The release of the Jack the Ripper letters proved to be a disastrous mistake. The resultant publicity did nothing to unmask the killer, nor for that matter, the letter's author. What it did do, however, was inspire imitations, and the police found themselves swamped by a wave of bogus Jack the Ripper correspondence. All this had to be read, assessed, and wherever possible, followed up. Thus, the resources and time of the already overstretched detectives was wasted. One of the most misreported initiatives of the Metropolitan Police that of using bloodhounds originated around this time. The idea had originally been given to Sir Charles Warren by the Home Office. Warren was not overly convinced that bloodhounds would be of any use and queried how a dog could be expected to track the killer without a piece of his clothing or a trace of his blood on streets where people have been walking all night long. His reservations notwithstanding, trials were held in two London parks and Warren appears to have found the results encouraging. Indeed, so impressed was he that he gave instructions that in the event of another murder, the body must not be touched until bloodhounds could be brought and put on the scent. On the 6th of October, Robert Anderson returned from leave and took overall charge of the police investigation. From that point on, he, like Swanson, became familiar with every facet of the case. On the 13th of October, the police began a massive search of some of the area's worst slums. For almost a week, officers entered every room of every house. They searched under the beds and looked inside the cupboards. They scrutinized every knife they could find and interviewed hundreds of landlords and their lodgers. But the killer evaded detection and letters purporting to come from him continued to frustrate the police investigation. Of all the correspondence sent in the wake of the original Jack the Ripper missive, one letter has been the subject of intense debate ever since. On the 16th of October, Mr George Lusk, president of the Mile End Vigilance Committee, received a small cardboard box in the evening mail. He opened it and there inside was a letter written in red ink and addressed from hell. Wrapped inside it was half a human kidney. The letter read... Sir. I send ye half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for ye. Tell the beast I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody nif that took it out, if you only wait somewhere longer. Signed, 
Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Convinced it was a practical joke, Mr. Lusk placed the box and the kidney in a drawer. But it played on his mind, and a few days later he showed it to the other members of the Vigilance Committee. They decided to take the kidney to a local medic, and it was handed over to the city police in whose jurisdiction Catherine Eddowes had been murdered. To this day, there is considerable debate as to whether or not this letter did come from the murderer. The evidence just simply isn't sufficient. We have statements by Major Smith, who was the acting assistant commissioner of, of the, uh, the city police at the time, who presented the kidney to the leading kidney expert of the day, Gowan Sutton, and believed that it was from Eddowes. But generally speaking, the, uh, the evidence would suggest that it wasn't. The amount of, of factual information that we, we've got there is, is not sufficient to draw any hard and fast conclusions, although the general opinion is that it wasn't. Lurid rumours in the press, together with several scares and false alarms, ensured that the atmosphere in Whitechapel remained tense and the police were nervously apprehensive that another killing was inevitable. Large bodies of plainclothes policemen were therefore drafted into the district from other parts of London, and these, together with the detectives already on the ground, were so numerous that in the more deserted thoroughfares, almost every man met with was a police officer. October passed with no further murders, and by early November, the area as a whole had breathed a huge sigh of relief as it seemed that the nightmare had ended. In the early hours of the 9th of November, 25-year-old Mary Kelly was heard singing in a room at number 13 Miller's Court. A little before 2am, a casual labourer named George Hutchinson met her on Commercial Street. She asked if he would lend her sixpence. He told her that he had no money. Observing that she'd just have to find it some other way, Mary Kelly continued along the street. A man coming from the opposite direction tapped her on the shoulder. She turned and spoke with him. They started laughing and Mary Kelly took the man by the arm and led him back along Commercial Street, walking straight past Hutchinson. He later recalled how the man stared at him in a sinister fashion. Mary Kelly led the man along Dorset Street and into Miller's Court. Hutchinson waited outside for 45 minutes, but when nothing happened, he left the scene. Shortly before 4am, two of Mary's neighbours heard a soft cry of murder, but since such cries were a common occurrence in the area, they both ignored it. At 10.45am on the 9th of November 1888, Mary Kelly's landlord, John McCarthy, sent his assistant, Thomas Bowyer, round to number 13 Miller's Court to collect her overdue rent. Moments later, an ashen-faced Bowyer returned. Governor, he stammered, I, I knocked on the door. I could not make anyone answer. I looked through the window and saw a lot of blood. The two men hurried back to Miller's Court, where looking through the broken window, John McCarthy gazed upon an horrific sight. The bedside table was covered with what appeared to be lumps of human flesh. And there on the bed, barely recognizable as human, lay the mutilated body of Mary Kelly. Soon, Inspectors Walter Dew and Walter Beck had arrived at the scene, and by 11.30 a.m., Inspector Aberline had joined them. But amazingly, it would be another two hours before any of them entered Mary Kelly's room. There was a delay between Mary Kelly's body being discovered by, by Thomas Bowyer, who had gone there to collect the rent, and the police actually entering the room because uh, somebody mistakenly believed that uh, bloodhounds were going to be brought to the scene. And in fact, they weren't, but, but they didn't know that. And it was only when a senior officer came along and, and said that the, there were going to be no bloodhounds that the police finally forced the door and entered the room. They couldn't actually get into the room because for some reason they thought the murderer must have had the key and locked the door. So in fact, when the people actually got into the room, they actually had to knock it down with an axe. They had to use a pickaxe to get into the room. 
John McCarthy, Mary Kelly's landlord, was no doubt giving vent to the feelings of all who witnessed the bloody carnage inside number 13 Miller's Court, when later that day he told a reporter, the sight that we saw, I cannot drive away from my mind. It looked more like the work of a devil than the work of a man. The whole scene is more than I can describe. I hope I may never see such a sight again. Mary Kelly had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column, just like the other victims. She was stabbed, ripped up from the rectum to the breastbone, disemboweled, various organs were taken away. Mary's injuries weren't all from a knife. An axe had also been used to basically cut all of her flesh off her thighs, and that thigh flesh was also on the bedside table. Um, apart from her body, her face was almost hacked beyond recognition. Her ears were cut off, her nose, her eyebrows, her lips. Complete disfigurement of the corpse took place in Miller's Court. The day, however, held a further surprise for the beleaguered detectives, because they went about their by now familiar routine of searching for clues and suspects. Word arrived that their commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, had resigned. Sir Charles Warren had attended his resignation several times over the, uh, the t his term of office and had resigned um, some time before the last murder. It just so happened that the resignation was accepted just before the, uh, the, the murder took place and that he left office uh, on the day that it happened. He hadn't in fact gone. He still remained commissioner of the Metropolitan Police because he hadn't been replaced. Nobody had been appointed in his stead. The week that followed Mary Kelly's murder saw an intense flurry of police activity. A hasty inquest was held on Monday the 12th of November and was brought to a close that same day, probably at the request of the police, in order to starve the press of the salacious gossip and gory detail of which they had made so much during the protracted inquests into the previous murders. The number of plainclothes officers in the area was increased from 89 to 143 and these men patrolled the streets of Whitechapel once darkness had fallen. Meanwhile, the Home Office authorised Sir Charles Warren, who despite his resignation still remained at his post, to issue a notice offering a pardon to any accomplice who would give information that would lead to the discovery and conviction of the killer. And the fresh panic that was now gripping the capital even snapped the patience of Queen Victoria, who fired off an angry missive to her Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. Queen Victoria had an active sort of interest in this case right from the beginning, really. Um, she actually had various petitions sent to her throughout the investigation by various groups trying to get things done. Um, but actually, after the double murder, she actually telephoned the Home Office to express her shock and to try and get information from them. And she telegrammed her Prime Minister the day after Mary Kelly's murder. And she says, this new, most ghastly murder shows the absolute necessity for some very decided action. All these courts must be lit and our detectives improved. So she obviously really had a passion for this case to try and stop these murders from happening and to try and catch the perpetrator. At noon on Monday the 19th of November, the bell at St. Leonard's Church in Shoreditch began to toll a morning knell as a coffin of elm and oak was carried out of the gates in front of a crowd some several thousand strong. Men and women alike could barely control their emotions as the funeral procession set off for St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Leighton. It was with great difficulty that the police forced a path for the cortege as onlookers jostled to touch the coffin and read its simple brass plate, Marie Jeanette Kelly, died 9th of November, 1888, aged 25 years. What nobody could have realised as Mary Kelly was laid to rest was that in Miller's court, Jack the Ripper had performed his swan song. That knowledge would be the knowledge of hindsight. In the weeks that followed, the panic and fear that had gripped the neighbourhood throughout the autumn began to abate as the residents turned their attentions once more to their everyday struggle for survival and the press began to focus on other matters and other areas. 
it's noticeable that in the case of Mary Kelly, when, when all the theorizing and all the, uh, the story and, and, and all the inquest had finished, it's almost as if somebody had just switched off a, a switch and, and the, the, the whole interest in the case just suddenly virtually died and it was revived uh, over the next few years every now and again. But after that one flurry, that one burst of press interest, the, the, the whole thing died. Mm -hmm.